This is the gemstone update, is the general topic. Um, there's a number of us here. Uh, one of the responses to not having small talk solutions is uh, several of us decided to come to Europe for ESAC. And so <laughs> I'm able to be here. Dale Hendricks is a seaside lead at Gemstone and longtime um, small talker. Martin McClure is here. He's the lead on the GBS uh, part of the product and some other things. Monty Williams is here. He's uh, leading the maglev effort and uh, business development and was one of the founders at Gemstone. So we'll be looking at some of the things that are going on. Many of you are familiar with Gemstone, even if you haven't used it, but uh, let me give just a brief introduction for some who may be new. Um, a small talk environment, a database system, and um, two in one. So we've got uh, both of those uh, in, the, in the environment. The small talk environment, a virtual machine com that compiles source code to machine code and executes it using the just-in-time compiler. Part of the virtual machine is an object manager that helps treat the entire repository as an object space. So what you would think of as an image in the traditional small talk uh, can be terabytes in size rather than limited to what can fit in RAM. And then in-memory garbage collection to reclaim space used. The database system provides transactional persistence, multi-user, and multi-machine, with garbage collection over the persistent objects. So a true object repository where instead of your small talk image, you have uh, as much as you can fit on disk. So we've been busy the last year since we uh, gave our update on things. We've had a 32-bit release of something called version 6.5.0.1.2. We've had a couple of 64-bit versions. 2.3 or 2.3 has come out this year, and 2.4 is due out um, next month, in the next couple, week or two. 6.5 has uh, performance improvements, uh, various additional features for counting instances, finding objects in the in the system. 32-bit project product um, actually I think doubles the number of supported platforms. We started with Solaris, PA RISC on HP, um, RS6000 with AIX, and Linux. And we've added x86 for Solaris, which uh, has extremely good performance. Um, you know, many of us are fans of Linux, but uh, the Solaris operating system on x86 is extremely stable and has extremely good performance. HP is uh, sunsetting the PA RISC architecture and is moving to Itanium, and so we have a number of customers who are examining alternatives there. And Linux, of course, and we have the Macintosh as well, so we'll be giving demo of that in a little bit. Improvements in performance, um, direct I.O., uh, commit record disposal, um, various intersections, differences on sets. We have a good uh, bit of extended character set, so internationalization, some movement for that, um, quad byte strings, UTF-8 encoding is something that Dale put in as primitives to help uh, the Seaside project. Counters, uh, compressed files, um, cache statistics, bug fixes. Version 2.4, um, again, numerous performance improvements. There's some customers who uh, have lots of logged in sessions and uh, reported to us that there's a certain number of round trips when you have lots of sessions. And so we found ways to reduce the number of round trips for some of those things, number of extents in the repository, um, keeping track of the time since the stone started, uh, when the session logged in, 
um, being able to list instances in a more efficient way. So extended character set, um, we are providing the ability to move towards ANSI compliance on the position. Um, Gemstone has one based positioning where the standard is zero based for ANSI. So that's going to take some changes, but we've come up with a way of allowing the legacy to coexist with the new in, in certain ways. Um, the upcoming release also supports 283 of Seaside, and we've been doing our Seaside 29 work there. And for example, partial continuations is something Dale added to support uh, the Seaside 29 work. And we'll be looking in some detail later on at uh, a new Meticello uh, code <coughs> package management. Sometime next year, version 3.0 uh, is currently being anticipated. Um, major VM rewrites, significant performance improvements, finally giving us the ability to make calls out to the DLLs. Um, a lot of there is Ruby support and some other capabilities that uh, will be helpful. Now, you've probably heard uh, Maglev. Yes? Um, one of the things to support Ruby, we wanted to be able to have um, methods so that the behavior would be different based on the sender of the message, um, not just the receiver. And so, ah! if, <laughs> if you um, think, think of it this way, if you have two competing packages that you want to load into your environment, and one has added a method, um, says, as foobar, and the other has added a method as foobar, and you want these two packages to be able to coexist. Essentially, what we're providing is namespacing for, pack for methods, not just class names. Excuse me? It's like selector namespace. Um, we've taken a different approach than um, some of the articles you've, uh, in your colleagues and students have published. Um, we're um, keeping it isolated so that if a method was compiled in a particular environment, then it will only execute methods that came from that environment. So, one of the things you could do is set up, for, for example, set up an ANSI sandbox and then create ANSI methods in it and um, those methods would be executed and you would get a does not understand if uh, that method was not in the environment that you've defined to, to have it, even if that method existed in another environment. So this is something that's giving us support for Ruby, where with, um, with this we can take the Ruby class library and drop it into Gemstone, and Ruby methods will have as, will find the method dictionaries and the compiled methods that are part of the Ruby class library, and Smalltalk will find compiled methods that are part of the Smalltalk class library. But uh, they're both coexisting in the same virtual machine, the same object space. Um, we'll give, uh, let's see, so the Ruby, we can come over to a Ruby environment. Um, I'm going to Let's see, maglev status. Okay, we've got a maglev environment running, and I can ask for a list of the gems, the Ruby gems that have been installed in this maglev environment, and Rake and Sinatra are a couple examples. I can take a 
Ruby program put S hello world and I can come over to an environment and say run this Ruby program. Um, we can narrow things down. Of course, Rubyists like to work in text editors. And so we'll uh, edit our program and save it and then start it up again. So there we're executing Ruby code um, from a gemstone environment. We can go to something more complex. Um, again, we mentioned that uh, Rake and uh, Sinatra are some uh, common popular Ruby programs. And so if we start up our environment and then try going there, we'll have a simple Sinatra blog where we can uh, go to new posts um, and uh, create our blog post. So again, this is um, tags, hello world, and um, we can look at all the posts, we can create new posts, and so on. Now, that is running Uh, code that uh, is just part of the standard Ruby environment. So I'm going to, uh, and um, Martin will be giving a talk later on in some of the technical challenges in supporting a second language from within the Smalltalk virtual machine. So he'll be going into some detail on that, and Monty is also heavily involved in the Ruby project. So. We'll be happy to discuss some of those things. So I'm going to go ahead and say um, rake maglev stop so that uh, we can free up some of those resources. And that stopped there. So now if I refresh, we're no longer running that. So getting started with gemstone. Um, there are several ways of running Gemstone. One is with uh, VMware. The value here is that the, in the process of setting up and installing is much less complicated. You can run it native, and then I'm going to show a Coco application that does this. The virtual appliance uh, comes under kind of a marketing name of Glass. Uh, Gemstone, Linux, Apache, Seaside, Smalltalk, or you can fit your own initials in. Um, Gemstone, Linux, Aida, Scribo, and Smalltalk. Um, plenty of other things can fit. Again, we view ourselves as a database, Smalltalk virtual machine, and taking uh, delight in seeing what people are doing with it. And we'll be looking at some examples of that. Um, we can run VMware server. So, for example, here I have a Linux machine that uh, is running Ubuntu uh, Linux. And this is in uh, VMware on the Mac. And with this, we have distributed a virtual machine that you simply install if you have VMware Fusion or VMware Server on Windows or Linux. With that, we can provide you with Gemstone pre-installed, configured, up and running. It just boots and is there, and you can just start using it. So that's one simple approach. Another approach is uh, going straight to the Mac. And so, for example, we can um, install it native and use command line. So if I say seaside start, um, this is going to start a database, start fast CGI, and I can go to um, my local machine, Apache, and um, that will be running Apache. Apache will redirect FastCGI to uh, Round Robin, three different
different virtual machines that will handle the requests. And so I can run through um, running Seaside here straight through Apache with the, the Mac native. Um, one of the things that I've been playing with, uh, again, kind of as a goodies project, is to teach myself Cocoa uh, programming, Objective-C, and to build a wrapper for Gemstone that allows the Mac aficionados to get into using Gemstone without having to go through the command line setup. And so, for that, we have um, for uh, you can download a or I, I have here a gemstone disk image that is about 78 meg and it opens and mounts and then allows you to drag the application to your applications folder. And having done that, you then have Gemstone in the applications directory, and when you launch it, um, it tells us that the address is already in use. That may be something left over from maglev. Um, go find the NetLDI process that's running, and... What? Yeah, it doesn't see it, so I'm just going to kill it. <laughs> and so it's gone. Um, so we, when this launches, if this is the first time, it will open a setup window and talk to you about some setup things that need to be done on the Mac because we need to install certain things as root to make uh, changes, for example, to shared memory configurations. The Mac, by default, has four megabytes of shared memory. We suggest uh, something like one gigabyte of shared memory for a database arrangements. So this allows us to set that. We need some log directories in the var directory, which is again uh, protected, and we need to uh, give you the chance to set up Etsy services. So those things can be done through uh, this tool. Then once we're started, we have a NetLDI running, and we can then say I want to create a new database. So I will create a new database. Rather than naming it Seaside, taking the default, I'm going to name it ESAG. And that will be the name of the database, and I will also make it the name of the file. So that will go through a process of creating the extents, copying some files over. So creating in your um, documents directory a database. And this database is a package that contains the database, the TRAN logs, and various other tools that we'll be looking at. So we can come here and say, well, go ahead and start the database. It goes through the scripts and says it's been started, and it's going to go look and find the other processes that are running, and then update our list. So here is a list of various processes running, and access to some log files and things like that. From there, we can, if we want, open a workspace and then do some of the usual small talk things. Two plus three printed gives us five. Um, Ten factorial uh, gives us something there. Um, we can start an HTTP server. And it's finding an illegal symbol there. So what we've done here is started up Hyper as a web server. 
And this is a long-running operation that will just continue to listen on a port and be available to provide um, so provide web pages. So then we can launch a web browser, and that takes us over here to the particular port that our application is listening on. And first time, it takes a moment to load up various things, but uh, here we've got um, our tests and uh, we're running through um, the small talk environment and executing code that's back in, uh, in the gemstone world. So, um, with that, we've got... Um, we can then go from our database and we can start up gem tools. Gem Tools is a Faro-based application that gives us visibility into um, I thought I had that fixed last night. Um, gives us visibility into the Gemstone Tools environment. So with that, you should be able to browse and edit code. Um, but we will I'll give that some thought while I'm moving on to a few other things. Um, so this gives us a way of loading, installing. Um, here, we can't shut down the system because there's someone else logged in. Well, that's our web server. So if we stop the web server, and then log out, then we can stop the database and the database is going to go through the shutdown process and when all the uh, items are detached, then we're done there. So that um, is, uh, is an example of how we can get into using Gemstone through a Cocoa application. Seaside, of course, is where a lot of our interesting work has been done. Um, we've been working on a tutorial, Learning Web Development with Seaside, that's available on the web, and you can download that. We've uh, done this at a number of conferences and different uh, events. So we have uh, had quite a bit of positive reaction from that. I will be uh, doing a tutorial at Uppsala, um, actually three of them, one on Smalltalk, one on uh, Gemstone Object Databases, and then one on Seaside. And the Scaffolding, for example, let me just try again and see if this will work for me. So I bring it up. So, one of the things that uh, people have done is built um, this is something called scaffolding. Oh, I need to be running. Excuse me. Let's start an HTTP server, and then when we do a web browser, Um, we have something called scaffolding. Actually, this is something that was created by uh, Gerhard um, Oberman, if I'm pronouncing that. Um, let's bring that over and see if I can run through a little bit of that demo.
So what we have is um, one of the applications. Um, we can create a class. Uh, so we have um, here is scaffolding for gemstone. There's help about credits and so on. If we go to classes, we can say create a class, and this will be a blog post, and the attributes will be title, content, and timestamp. And we save that. We can edit the title to make it a required field. And you will probably recognize much of this as being based on the Greek. And we can we can change the types so that content is a memo field, so that it's edited with a multi-line widget. And we'll change timestamp so that it's a timestamp field. And save that. We can then save our various attribute changes. Go to administration, create a project. This will be a blog project with blog. Um, Seaside blog server. And the model class is blog post. Once we save that, we're given a link where we can open it. So I'll go to a new tab. We've got our list of blog posts, three columns, and the report is empty. So my first blog post, and um, And we can say the current time, save that. And so now if we go look at the list, there's a list of multiple of them. And so we can show it, um, see it, and we can say, well, having the content in the middle is a little bit distracting. Why don't we go back and change the order of the classes for the instvars so that the timestamp is second. And so save that, come back over and refresh. And um, when we show it, now the timestamp is in the middle with the content being at the end. We can create a second class. where um, we're going to have a blog comment. So create class, blog comment, and the blog comment will have author, timestamp, content. And save, make the timestamp a timestamp field. Save that and make the content a memo field. Save that. And notice here that we have not put any back pointers to the blog. That uh, this, as, as you would in a relational model, we're just uh, leaving it, and we'll come back to the classes list and say we're going to edit the blog post so that it now has comments. And the comments, we don't want that to be a string. We want it to be a many-to-one or one-to-many. Save that and change the edit it so that it has just blog 
comments as its type. So then if we go refresh our editor, we now have a three column comment area where we can add um, show, edit, okay, and then add a comment. Um, James current and comments. So here we've got the one to many relationship handle, and again, as you would uh, have with the um, various fields um, here, add and remove. Um, we can, from this, toggle halos and go look at the code that's been generated and see that um, our blog post We've got blog comment, blog post. Um, these things are have descriptions um, that describe them, again, using the, uh, the Greek. So we have a couple of domain objects and four views that work together to provide us with, uh, with this. And again, this is not something that Gemstone did. This is just something that some of uh, others have done. I believe I have 15 minutes. Yes. Okay. So, um, that uh, is the scaffolding. Now, Meticello. Meticello is uh, something that Dale created to solve some problems that he's uh, having in managing Monticello packages. And this is something that uh, you know, code management tools are certainly around and prevalent, but uh, there is always a challenge to uh, having them work well for us. Monticello provides code management, which does atomic loading of code that's in a package. And you can compare changes between two packages. But it doesn't scale up in managing multiple packages in a very elegant fashion. Meticello is a package management system, as opposed to a sort of code management, that sits on top of Monticello. So the packages are still Monticello packages. The packages are managed as projects, and so we've got groups of packages that are managed together. It follows the Monticello approach of having declarative modeling. So the Meticello project has named versions consisting of lists of explicit Monticello package versions. The dependencies are explicitly expressed in terms of named versions, required projects. So you can have references from one project to another. And a required project references another Monticello project. Like Monticello, it supports distributed repositories because, as we'll see shortly, the project, the data is just code stored in a Monticello package. So a Monticello description is simply contained in a Monticello package. As a result, it's easy to distribute distributed groups to work together. Again, following the Monticello model, there's optimistic development. So you can keep up to date, you can make changes, and since everything is just in a Monticello package, you can view um, differences and merge. Cross-platform, um, Dale has provided uh, in this using Squeak, Faro, Gemstone, and we, um, if uh, other dialects of small talk support Monticello, we would like to um, 
see that if they could support Menicello as well, um, would, would certainly work there. Conditional loading is one of the areas that uh, forms a challenge when you're trying to manage code across uh, Squeak, Faro, and Gemstone, as uh, is happening with the Seaside work. So there is common code that's common to all platforms. Squeak, common, that's part of Squeak and Faro. Squeak specific, Faro specific, Gemstone specific. You can also have conditional loading based on local attributes. So Gemstone version 2x versus Gemstone version 3x. And then a goal is to support other package-based code distribution. So when MC2 comes out, uh, it, we should be able to work with that as well. The license is MIT, and it's out in uh, a Monticello code repository, a uh, server that you can download the code and work with it. One of the goals, again, is managing dependencies. And so you can see here is an example of um, the packages, the Monticello packages that go into making uh, the glass distribution. And keeping that up to date and synchronized is uh, a challenge, and the tools don't lend themselves to, to doing that very easily. With Meticello, you define in code um, a, a project definition where you just say, and let me see if I can zoom in on parts of this. So, for example, the package spec adds core, and project has this name and version, and specifies a series of things. We'll look in a bit more detail at some of these specifications um, in the next few minutes. Um, so, Meticello Project Tutorial. Um, Dale has a tutorial that uh, some sample projects. And so here is a Meticello Tutorial project that uh, has uh, a number of examples. So in this example, the version spec is made up of one package that's an example that comes from a particular repository. Version 2, uh, and so you'll notice this is version, you know, the Monticello package 8. So here, you know, the next version of this is Monticello 9. So that's one way of approaching it. Here we see an example of two packages that are part of version 3 of this project. Here we have, um, and in version 3 here you see that we've specified the repository on each line. But if you have several of them that are coming from the same place, you may want to just say, all the repositories, or by default, the repositories will come from here. You can kind of continue increasing the complexity of, uh, of it. Um, here we have a couple packages, and then we've defined some requirements. So there's example core, and in, in in order to do the example add-on, you need example core. And in order to do example tests, you need example core. So this is defining prerequisites. And here is perhaps the more complex example, where the version spec has a blessing, a description. There's do-its to be executed at particular points. There's groups. There's packages, product package, and repository. So these are various things that aren't just being thrown in 
in an effort to say how complex can we make it, but it has significantly simplified and eased the development process for managing the code that, uh, that's being managed in the small talk and uh, the seaside work that we're doing. So for example, uh, blessing, uh, alpha, beta, and it can be used as a filter. Description, packages, a list of Monticello package versions, or project references that make up the project. The repositories, where the packages are coming from. Groups, you can define an alias for a collection of packages. Do its code that is evaluated before and or after a package is loaded. Definition of a package name and uh, the repository from which the latest project metadata is to be loaded. Again, one key point here is that the metadata is in the package. You can load the metadata without loading the actual thing that the <coughs> metadata refers to. So in this example, I have a peer image and I have loaded the Meticello package named Gemstone Peer. So I can look at and use tools to investigate what would get loaded in Gemstone for Peer. And one of the challenges with some of the other approaches is in order to edit something, it has to be loaded. And if you have trouble loading something, then it's hard to fix it because you can't load it and edit it and then save it. So with the metadata being explicitly described in code, we have a much cleaner ability to um, bring in and just say, well, there's something wrong with the gemstone peer uh, project. So I'm going to load the metadata into a Faro image and, you know, identify, well, we shouldn't have um, version such and such. We should have something else instead. So this gives us those sort of abilities. Um, we can identify uh, conditional loading. Um, there's a number of tools that are built in to the Omni browser. So from, if you select the class command, there's save packages, update package methods, update package repository, current project version, load the project, save the project, update the project. And each of these has various um, parts where, say, find the dirty Monticello packages and save them asking for names and comments. And then gives you a chance to say, that now represents either the current version or a new version of the environment and the project. So there's a series of, uh, of tools and capabilities there. Again, the idea is that you can split things out into a bit more of a granular approach so that if you want to load peer into your environment, you can bring up the definition for peer and say, I want to bring in peer, core, and add-ons. And part of the metadata will say, well, these pieces rely on this part of Seaside and that part of Seaside. But you don't have to just load everything in and if you're developing for a particular environment, you can have more control over what's getting loaded. So we can start with a minimal base image and specify what we want to load into it rather than just getting all or nothing. 
So the things that Peer depends on, if Magritte, these parts of Magritte are needed, this part of Seaside, if Scriptaculus is part of it, then it will come in. If it's not, then it doesn't need to come in. So if you want to see what GS Peer Meticello project is, there's uh, a picture of it. So the Peer 4 has model, test, security, setup, and Seaside. And the add-ons, um, log, design, tag cloud, randomizer, Twitter, and so on. So this is a way of identifying this is what we want to load. So um, I think that brings us up to our, um, our closing point. A uh, couple questions. And again, um, I believe Dale spent much of yesterday working with people on, um, on uh, Meticello. And the presentation on this, um, I told Dale that uh, uh, I cut and pasted uh, quite extensively from his blog post, so you can get a lot of this information on, from Dale's blog and uh, work through it. Um, as I say, um, Monty, Martin, Dale, and I are here and would be delighted to talk with you about any of these uh, areas. Yes. Yes. Hi, James. Uh, I have a question. Maybe Martin is going to talk about that on Thursday, but uh, I'd like to know why you created a sandbox of methods instead of a sandbox of objects. I mean, it looks like if you create something like a sandbox of objects, you, you get sandbox of methods by default. I mean, to that. Okay, I guess I'll maybe better let that come Tomorrow. online. That's, that's Long uh, um, yeah, I guess I, I don't know exactly what you're proposing or how detailed that design would have been considered. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yes. Me? Yes. Okay. Uh, just a short question. You said that uh, the meta cello is designed to support Another version controlling system, yes. maybe Monticello 2 or something like that. Do you plan to support multiple version controlling systems in one project? So have a half package in Monticello, half package of Monticello 2, and uh, one package in Mesia, for instance. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> on Saturday, the answer would have been no, but I think today the answer is yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. The changes that uh, Tutor and I, I worked on yesterday basically make it possible to have a project that is a little more homogenous. Because um, in the, there's technical reasons, but... Uh, yeah, we can discuss later. Okay, okay. Yeah. thank you. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think some of it is just if you have abstract objects and they're polymorphic so you can send them messages like load yourself, um, and if the object knows where its stuff is supposed to come from, yeah. there's, there's that. Um, let's see, we had a question here. Someone bring a mic down front. And you can also put up your hand and get the mic ready. Hello. Um, I find the Coco application yes. very cool. Uh -huh. And the uh, question is, is this supposed to be uh, usable or used for production setup as well, or is it just as a tool like the appliance for developers? Um, I think that we encourage it to be more of a developer introduction. On the other hand, the Coco part of it is essentially just building buttons and menus on top of shell scripts. And so the underlying gemstone server database and VM is equivalent. You know, it's, it's, it's the same thing underneath. And so I guess I would say if clicking on the button starts the database, then once the database is running, it's a production database, so um, I 
don't see a problem with that. But uh, it's, it's actually enough of a Skunk Works unofficial project, so I don't know that you know, anything about it should be used in the same paragraph with the word supported. But, uh, but it's, it's intended to entice more people who have Macs just to give Gemstone a try without having to go through the command line nonsense. Is there any reason not to use Jensen? I mean, why is people not using it? Oh, um, okay. <laughs> well, you, you need to ask, you know, ask other people that a bit. I guess I would say uh, several things. First, it's, it doesn't have a GUI. Okay? So, it, you know, 20, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, if you were building a client server application, you know, it's the database, not the front end. Um, next, it's designed for high-end industrial strength, uh, you know, large systems, where many of you here have worked on Gemstone projects. And historically, the way to learn Gemstone was to be sent by your employer to a week-long training class. And um, so the idea of downloading it and having it just run was not where the focus of the development was. So it's, it's not historically been nearly as approachable. Um, another thing is historically it's not just been designed for, but priced for the enterprise. And um, at, if, if you ask for the price and we tell you it's 100000 per core, um, you're probably not going to you know, show much interest in pursuing that. Um, those things have changed. Again, we've tried to make it more approachable, easier to use. Um, there are, and, and I'm exaggerating on the price, there are a variety of pricing approaches, including free for commercial use. Um, so the, there's a free version, um, four gigabytes of data, one <laughs> CPU core um, that uh, is a perpetual license with not, no restrictions. So it's not, uh, not for non-commercial, not for valuation. So, you know, that is intended to make it approachable. Um, and then some of the other things just to try to make it easier to get started. But so today for a seaside app, small enough, there's no reason not to use it. <laughs> well, again, I think that you're going to see yeah. some demos. Well, it, yes, no reason. no reason not to use it. I'm, no, I'm going to try to be um, a little bit more industry friendly here than partisan. Um, I gave you a little demo of something that someone put together called scaffolding. Um, I think that when you see later this week web velocity, you will uh, see scaffolding for what it is, which is a poor imitation of web velocity. Um, um, if you, Gemstone historically has not had the depth of add-on libraries. So if you want an XML parser, you're more likely to find it in VisualWorks than you are in Gemstone. Um, though, you know, that specific example we may have. But um, I think that there are a lot of reasons to consider a lot of alternatives. And I think that people will f find the tools here are developing in strength, but I think historically some of the other small talk dialects have had much stronger tools. And refactoring browser is something that we don't have in Gemstone that others have had for decades or something. So um, Gemstone is something that you should consider and you should seriously investigate using. But uh, there are other dialects that have other strengths for other reasons. And that's where I'll go with that. Uh, in, at least in front of a large audience with the camera running. <laughs>
I'm curious about the uptake of Maglev and just what the Ruby community felt about that. I, I read some of the blog posts, I don't know, there must have been about eight months ago, where they're sort of <clears throat> scorning and saying it couldn't possibly work, it couldn't be so fast, and you know, there was a lot of buzz around Maglev and, and what you presented at that conference. Could you comment on just... Well, sure. I think first, as was mentioned in the previous talk, um, there's no such thing as bad publicity. <laughs> and so, um, you know, we, we certainly did get quite a bit of uh, press, you know, or at least in uh, some blog comments about things. Um, there's some truth to you can't possibly be that fast, you know, in the sense of uh, as one works out some details and reruns the, the test, you know, there were some that turned out to be a little bit this way, a little bit that way. And also, if the game you're playing is performance, that's not necessarily a game that you can hold the lead in indefinitely. And if simply being a faster Ruby VM is the goal, I don't think Gemstone has that much value to add. Um, some, yes, you know, the, the MRI, the current Ruby interpreter, the, the standard Ruby interpreter is slow and buggy and crashes. And so a stable, fast Ruby VM would have unquestionable value. But uh, persistence is, I think, you know, object persistence without the object <laughs> relational mapping. And actually, coming back to the comment of other uh, reasons, if you need to go to an object, if you need to go to a relational database, which, you know, is what most projects out there need to do, then um, you're probably going to see less value in using Gemstone. So, you know, I think the Ruby community, once they start realizing on greenfield projects that don't have to go to a relational database, um, some value in, uh, in object persistence. But, are, I mean, are you getting any good feedback from the Ruby community? I mean, oh, I, the yes, are still yes. developing, so obviously there's some... Yeah, no, Monty is, you know, and can comment, but we're... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Is this on? Yes. Yeah, I mean, we are getting a lot of good feedback. Uh, as Martin will give a talk on Wednesday about some of the difficulties of uh, implementing Ruby on top of the small talk VM. The languages are more different than you might think. The object models are similar, but uh, Ruby has a lot of uh, uh, dynamism that you don't see in small talk. You know, a simple example would be that, oh, sure, I can just uh, add extra, you know, in small talk you've got a, a nice uh, you know, method with a fixed number of uh, parameters that you're going to call with. And in Ruby, you just go, oh, let's just add a few more onto the end and we'll just handle that. So, mapping that stuff onto Smalltalk, uh, you know, is, uh, is non trivial. But it is that fast. Uh, we haven't had any actual decreases in performance since we started, despite Charles Nutter saying that, oh, it's going to slow down by a factor of a thousand or whatever. We haven't found that yet. We're not finished, so we may find things that, uh, you know, that do that. But like James says, the value is not just that the VM is faster, but that you have the ability to have, uh, just like we do with Smalltalk, a bunch of distributed virtual machines operating off of the same, you know, essentially image, even though in the Ruby world, it's, it's they think of it as files, not as an image. But you know, when you get, when you want to run, uh, you know, fire up another Ruby VM and not have to load everything from files, you can have it there in a shared in-memory cache. So, uh, you know, there's, there's a per VM performance, but there's also overall application performance. So we think it's going to be a really strong contender uh, in the Ruby world. It's just we can't finish it in a year like we hope. It's going to be maybe you know, two years it takes us to finish it. But uh, we're plugging away. And uh, I have, uh, you know, if anybody's really interested, come talk to me. I can give you an alpha copy. I actually have it on a thumb drive here. So if people are really interested, uh, that's cool. And it's, uh, as James showed, it's running Sinatra now, which is a, a, 
the Ruby web, web framework that's you know similar. I can't say similar really, but it's a web framework. Yeah. And uh, you know it runs some standard things and other things it doesn't because when you implement a language not uh, from scratch but on top of a you know of another VM, you get a lot of stuff that works right up front, but the holes are still there that you have to fill in. So. You know, it may run this part really great, and then you know, you hit a hole that is really uh, simple or stupid. You know, like, uh, can't return from a break statement, can't return up two levels, can only pop up one level. You go, oh, okay, got to implement that. So yeah, there so are there's, holes that we're still implementing. There's, there's work being done, and I think, you know, it'll be interesting to see how the Ruby community reacts to it. But, um, it, we've, we've gone a bit over with questions. Um, I think I should let people break for uh, lunch, but uh, I would like to continue this conversation um, with uh, anyone of you who, who is interested. So please uh, look for us. That's why we're here, is to share this. <laughs>